Thank you, brother, for this introduction. So uh, I will start, I guess. Uh, the Liberation Front of the Slovenian Nation was an organization that led political and armed resistance against the fascist invaders and uh, local Quislings. It was established on this day, um, April 27, uh, 1941, in Ljubljana, shortly after the Axis powers um, disintegrated uh, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. To begin, I need to explain uh, why it is necessary to study this event from the remote past. The reason is political. At the Workers and Punks University, we are working very hard to develop a new political concept of democratic socialism. In order to do this, it is absolutely necessary to build a critical position regarding socialist projects in the past. And the Liberation Front, as a part of Yugoslav anti-fascist movement, was a crucial step forward the establishment of socialism in Slovenia. At this point, I would say it's not so much about fear of repeating the grave mistakes of socialism that actually existed a long time ago, but more about the neutralization of the ideologies, or more simply, prejudice, which for decades have prevented us from thinking seriously about socialism. To be sure, amid the development of recent political events in Slovenia, in times of growing discontent, the mainstream media and so-called civil society circles, uh, the notion was shown considerable interest. One non-parliamentary left liberal party, the Party for Sustainable Development of Slovenia, even took up the notion and now uses the term democratic ecological socialism. Uh, something like that would have been unthinkable just six months ago. Although the idea of democratic ecological socialism stands for overcoming neoliberalism through the promotion of non-profit companies, cooperatives, a more equal distribution of wealth, sustainable development, workers' co-ownership of companies, co-management, and so on, it symptomatically avoids the issue of class conflict, that is to say the ruptures and the antagonisms that such a radical program should of necessity bring into the society. Moreover, when the historical background for ecological socialism was presented in the media, Praise was given to Christian socialism and some elements of socialist self-management in Yugoslavia. But the revolution which realized the project in question was passed over in silence. Something similar happened at the initial stage of the people's uprising, that is, large demonstrations in Slovene towns in late autumn of the last year. At the time, the prominent historian Bože Repe called for a united platform of resistance against neoliberal political elite, similar to the resistance movement of 1930s and 1940s, while at the same time denouncing any form of the exclusion or Comintern style uh, differentiation of the left. In other words, he called for People's Front political strategy, but one that would be distilled from the ideological struggle. He further praised the unifying capacity of the Slovenian liberation movement during the Second World War, while at the same time expressing dismay about its dark side, that it, its communist dominance. In other words, at the Workers and Punks University, we are uh, trying to introduce the concept of democratic socialism into an ideological milieu haunted by the ghost of the 1980s Slovenian civil society movement. This historical movement was a terrible failure, or success, <laughs> depends on which side do you look at. <laughs> its basic aim was to introduce greater civil liberties through activism by distinguished groups at a time when socialism as an egalitarian economic model was collapsing in Yugoslavia. Of course, the problem was not that groups were fighting for freedom of the press and so on. The problem was they brought all their differences with them. 
We must take into account that civil society movement in the 80s was made up of extreme nationalists and leftists. The nationalists were in favor of abolishing socialism, while the leftists were not. Dialogue and tolerance were the slogans of the day, and class struggle was not on the agenda. Leftist movements didn't forge an alliance with industrial workers, who were becoming very militant at the time. So, by renouncing ideological struggle in the ranks of the emerging anti-neoliberalism movements, we run the risk that national populism will again win the hegemony. Moreover, without ideological ruptures, it is impossible to define the political left itself. According to the history of class struggles, civil society is a battleground for ideological hegemony. And this battle is by no means only waged between oppressors and oppressed, or in political terms, between conservatives and progressive, but also within these groups. According to Gramsci, this is because the ruling class cannot perform its dominance without a certain degree of approval from the oppressed. If the oppressed want to fight their oppressors, then conflict within the ranks is unavoidable. The history of the Slovenian liberation movement in the 1930s and 1940s and the emergence of the Liberation Front provides a perfect example. So in my lecture, I will elaborate upon the history by emphasizing its bad side. I will talk about discontent and ruptures. Mainstream liberal historiography in Slovenia depicts this bad side as the communist hijacking of the liberation movement, while conservatives simply define it as totalitarianism. However, both fail to explain how something like that could happen in the first place, considering how big the communists were before the war. My point is as follows. True, the communists opposed parliamentary democracy and invested all their efforts in abolishing it, but they could do this only because there was a pronounced discontent among the people regarding political parties. And there was a reason behind this discontent. The historical materialist approach to the history of the Liberation Front reveals the real condition of the specific development of Yugoslav socialism, and especially its dominant force, the Communist Party of Slovenia and Yugoslavia. By no means, I'm saying that the historical contextualization of the development of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia as a uh, militaristic Stalinist cadre organization can explain all the contradiction of the development of Yugoslav socialism. It can, however, explain the foundation of the new society that arrived immediately after the war. Because the victory of the liberation movement led by the communists made possible the nationalization of industry and banking system and somehow less radically agrarian reform that still favored poor peasants. Expropriators were expropriated. That was the basic condition for the experiments with self-management of later decades. In other words, it is not possible to praise certain positive achievements of socialist self-management in the 1970s, a time when social standard was high, but to neglect the revolutionary process that made them possible. Only by taking the latter into account can we assess and criticize the ultimate failure of the Yugoslav communist movement and define the discontents with our time, when the emergence of a new radical left political subject is again necessary. I am emphasizing the idea of several Marxist scholars who have argued that the agents of capital accumulation, systemic forces at Waller Street Company would put it, shape the grounds for the resistance. It was very fashionable, for example, from 1960s on, when scholars were searching for the roots of Stalinism to criticize the Bolshevik party as a conspirator organization which allegedly copied Bakunin's concept of conspiracy. But I would ask, why did Bakunin and the whole glorious Russian populist movement chose the elitist organization as its forum in the first place? 
The answer is simple. The Western type of civil society as discussed by Gramsci simply didn't exist in Imperial Russia. All this was supposed to be self-evident, but here in Slovenia, in public polemics and even in the scientific press, one gets the feelings that communists were some kind of space invaders, who did little more than take advantage of the hardships of poor Slovenian people, a conspiracy, so to speak. To be sure, Slovenian Yugoslav communists really appeared at first glance to be a conspiracy, and the history of Yugoslav and Slovene communism from 1920 until 1945 is a history of disasters. The Yugoslav regime managed to keep the communist movement in relative obscurity, and communists from the part were far from a very long time unable to apply the appropriate tactics to avoid this obscurantism. However, the Yugoslav communists were not the only political force in the country which uh, supported anti-capitalism. Liberalism was weak. In my presentation, I will elucidate the following point. Before the war, the Slovene Yugoslav elites could not perform their dominance without a declarative stance of anti-capitalism. These elites therefore strive to invent alternative economic forms, peasants' cooperatives being the most important. The fascist occupation, however, discredited the old political and social establishment. These were the conditions in which the communist anti-capitalist program was able to emerge from obscurity. This fact marks the most important discontinuity with our times. Neoliberalism as an ideology and practice of contemporary elites not only declaratively opposes any and all alternatives to capitalism, it also promotes social stratification while at the same time being able very effectively to integrate economic alternatives. And that is one of the reasons why contemporary struggles for socialism are taking place in a very, I, I could say, completely different environment. It also means that resentment towards the revolutionary past, in reality, means ignorance of the conflictive nature of contemporary societies. In my lecture, I will fo focus on how communist anti-capitalism won hegemony in Slovenia and Yugoslavia. In, in order to do this, I now turn to the liberation front of the Slovenian nation and its history. Uh, the National Liberation Front uh, uh, consisted of 18 groups. With the exception of the Communist Party of Slovenia, which played the leading role, none of them was formally organized as a political party. These groups were Christian Socialist Labor Union activists, Christian Socialist intellectuals, small group of dissidents from the Catholic Slovene People's Party, liberal cultural workers, the left wing of the so-called gymnastic movement, liberal alliance of the associations of peasant boys and girls, and others. The Liberation Front in Slovenia was in a way a typical mid-1930s People's Front organization. This set the Slovenian resistance movement apart from developments in other parts of Yugoslavia, where Communist People's Front strategy failed for the most part. Why did political development in Slovenia take shape differently than in other parts of Yugoslavia? An important reason is that the political elites in Slovene territories were relatively more fragmented than elites in other parts of Yugoslavia. The 1930s Kingdom of Yugoslavia was highly centralized an authoritarian state. The monarchist regime, backed mostly by the Serbian military and political establishment, strived to, to liquidate all national particularities. The French melting pot model was the idea. Serbian elites, however, lacked the power to implement this unitarist agenda and had to make concessions and compromises. In the Slovene territories, the strongest political power, power was the Catholic Slovene People's Party, which promoted autonomism but was willing to make compromises with centralism. In return, it received some government posts 
as well as Central Economic Assistance for Slovene peasants, cooperatives during the severe economical crisis. These compromises with the unpopular Belgrade regime caused conflicts within the Catholic Party and also within the Catholic political movement in general. We must keep in mind that the political party seen in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia in general had limited space of maneuver. The dictatorship under King Alexander from 1929 to 1931 initially abolished all political parties and introduced a military and police regime. After 1931, the former political parties were forced to merge into two all national political groups, the Yugoslav National Party for Liberals and the Yugoslav Radical Alliance for Conservatives. In the Slovene territories, both liberals and conservatives eventually joined these parties and by doing so paved the way for the formation of groups that were starkly opposed in their lines and movements. The regime, however, was with some exceptions unable and unwilling to repress political activities that continued on the levels of the press, publishing, association and religion. Especially the Slovene territories, this meant that the influence of the Catholic Church and its lay organization, Catholic Action, and student and trade union movements became increasingly strong since they made their in 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 infrastructure available to the illegal or semi-legal Slovene People's Party. So the Slovene People, People's Party could not liquidate its internal lineages because the latter had a solid institutional background. Without them, the influence of the Catholic Party would have been very limited. The weakness of the Slovene political establishment and the weakness of the Catholic Party in particular were manifested when Serbian and Croat elites forged the so-called Cvetković Maček Agreement in 1939, which granted more autonomy to their territories. Slovenes were excluded from these negotiations, but the greatest weakness of the Slovene political establishment showed itself during the occupation. It is well known that Yugoslavia was disintegrated into more than 10 administrative units by the Axis Alliance. But these units didn't have equal status. For example, the Croat territories and a substantial part of Bosnia without Dalmatia became part of a client state, the so-called independent state of Croatia. The Serbian territories were eventually given similar autonomy, while the Slovene territories were, di were divided up among Germany, Italy, and Hungary. Representatives of the Slovene political parties tried to negotiate with German forces to get the status of protectorate, something like Slovakia, but were, were dismissed. German forces began immediately with ethnic cleansing. The Hungarians abolished all Yugoslav institutions, while the Italians applied a more pragmatic approach. They granted a limited degree of cultural and economic autonomy but strictly forbade all political activities. This development was one of the reasons that parts of the old political establishment detached from the old political parties and forged a national liberation co a coalition with the communists. But even more important were the divisions in the political and especially the Catholic mainstream on social issues. The Kingdom of Yugoslavia was a typical peripheral state to put it uh, 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 more correctly, by the late 1930s, it had evolved to the status of periphery of the European semi-periphery made up of Germany and dependent Central and Southern European states. Uh, by 1938, 50% of Yugoslav foreign trade was with Germany and another 15% was with Italy. As early as 1934, 60% of the grain exported from Yugoslavia went to Germany. Germany was willing to pay 30% about the market price for the grain. Yet Yugoslavia mostly traded grain for German machinery, electronics, and so on. According to the 1931 census, 
76% of the Yugoslav population supported themselves with income from agriculture and fishing, while only 10% were employed in industry and skilled crafts. In the Slovene territories, 60% of population supported itself with agriculture. In addition, 67% of all peasants in Yugoslavia lived on holdings that were smaller than 3 hectares. Three hectares. Together they possessed 28% of the total land area. In all parts of Yugoslavia except the Slovene territories, the illiteracy rate was over 50%. Illiteracy. Populist political parties with strong ties to the peasant population were consequently the strongest in the country, especially in the Slovene and Croat territories. Social democracy was weak. The Yugoslav Communist Party had initially been very strong. National elections in 1920, the party finished third and managed to organize strikes and large demonstrations in support of the Soviet Russia. But the party was soon officially banned. In 1921, some 70,000 communists and other trade union activists were arrested. Party membership dropped from 65,000 in 1920 to 1,000 in 1924. By 1929, membership had, had decreased to only 300 members. That year, the communists called for an uprising against the dictatorship and failed miserably. Their failure is in a way reminiscent of the Shanghai uprising. The party was completely disorganized. In the mid-1930s, there were three different leadership centers, two of which were located abroad in some time in Paris, in the other time in Vienna. The common term was fed up and it, it nearly dissolved the Yugoslav party. In addition, nearly 900 Yugoslav party members disappeared in the USSR in the 1930s. All party, all party first secretaries except Tito, literally vanished, were shot or were lost in camps. Several hundred died in Spanish Civil War. Membership grew in the second half of 1930s. By 1940, it had reached 7,000 members, uh, with, an, uh, with an additional 70,000 members in the Youth Communist League. It didn't have a firm position regarding the national question. And uh, what, if any, ties it had with peasantry were very weak. I won't go into details, but having read party press from the time, I will say the party was terribly boring. At least until the mid-1930s. But even later, after the end of the war, party theoreticians relied more or less on simple concepts of orthodox Marxism-Leninism. I will, however, admit that they push these concepts to their limits in order to apply them to the concrete political reality. It is, in fact, it, uh, it is in fact hard to resist drawing a parallel with the 1980s. In the 1930s, anti-systemic communist social theory was relatively poor, but the political forums of the anti-fascist movement were extremely rich. I shall soon turn to them. In the 1980s, it, it was completely the opposite. Theory flourished from Marxist political economy to the famous Ljubljana school of Lacanism, Freudism, and so on. But the political invention of the opposition did not extend beyond civil society. I find this fact enigmatic, and I have no idea how to explain it. So if you want to understand what was decisive for the Yugoslav Socialist Revolution during and after the Second World War, we should pay more attention to the non-Marxist populist movement. 
in the Slovene territories, but also in the Croat territories, this was the strongest movement, in the sense that it had very firm ties with peasantry. I already mentioned that the Catholic Slovene People's Party suffered from internal rifts caused by the pragmatism of the leadership. But they also emphasized that the party itself was only a part of the larger Catholic movement. And further, the Catholic Slovene People's Party depended heavily on that movement. So the rift which had emerged there was really fatal. I would now like to examine the relationship between the Slovene People's Party and the Catholic movement in greater detail. The history of this relationship reveals how the national bourgeoisie in Slovene, Slovene territories was formed in the 19th century. It was a typical peripheral bourgeoisie with strong ties with, strong ties with agriculture. In the second half of the 19th century, but even until the 1930s, the most important industrial and financial capitalists in Slovenia were Germans, Frenchmen and Czechs. The formation of the Slovene bourgeoisie was the result of a dual confrontation with the non-Slovene agents of culture, state administration and capital accumulation. These confrontations, the confrontations took place in the field of culture. It resulted in the formation of the national literary canon. Liberals uh, did this. And being the field of economy, it meant the establishment of a small saving bank networks. The cornerstone of this national economic policy were the peasants' credit cooperatives, organized by the early Christian socialist movement led by Janes Evangelist Kreg. These cooperatives mobilized peasant savings. In theory, these cooperatives were supposed to serve only to direct peasant interests in order to save the peasantry from usury. But in reality, they secured financing for the Catholic Party and its activities. What is most important is that the, that the ideology of the Catholic cooperative movement was Christian socialism, which was against capitalism and for social justice and solidarity, but of course opposed to the class struggle promoted by social democracy and later by the communists. It essentially stood for brotherhood between different social strata. The very strong Catholic Workers' Trade Union was founded as well. Two brief conclusions. The most important and modern Slovene political vocal party was born out of corruption. I'm saying this only because our neoliberals today claim this is an important historical reason for the underdevelopment of the Slovene society that this is why we are supposedly lagged behind. But the complete op opposite is true. It was the on it, that was the only way. The young Slovene bourgeoisie could not really compete with their foreign counterparts, who were backed by the Imperial Austrian state. And no, this movement was in reality the leading modernizing force, for it brought the idea of socialism to this point to the simply stated belief that solidarity among the people is something good and worth fighting for. Today, on the right side, we have nobody who would still stand for the principles like that. Although the revolutionary process before and during the war reshaped this old Catholic ideal fundamentally, it was heavily dependent on it. And as a matter of fact, it was far more dependent than it was ready to admit. We now turn back to the 1930s. Catholic socialism was in severe crisis. The economic crisis in the early 1930s had put the project of peasant cooperatives in jeopardy. At the same time, the, people, uh, 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 the Pope's encyclical Quadragesimo Anno forbade socialism in the Catholic movement. Fascism was on the rise and the distinguished uh, faction of the Catholic movement saw in fascism quasi-anti-capitalist anti-capitalism, the solution to the old corporate Catholic socialist ideal. Extreme right-wing Catholicism was on the rise among the students and supported by Catholic action. 
but the Catholic mainstream was ambiguous regarding fascism. It partly favored fascism because it was anti-communist, but at the same time it was reluctant because it meant a strong state. The old political Catholicism, on the other hand, supported autonomism because it fitted the paradigm of patriarchal small communities where brotherhood between different social strata supposedly could have been realized most effectively. And what was more impo most important, the regime in Belgrade, namely the government of Milovan Stojadinovic, in the mid-30s, wanted to reform Yugoslavia according to the Italian moral model of the corporatist state. The Slovene People's Party joined the government but remained reluctant toward this project. The Croat Populist Peasant Party opposed the project as well. As a result, Yugoslavia didn't transform into a fascist state. The elites were only able to merge Yugoslavia with the Axis powers in early 1941. The development I just described was explosive for the Slovene People's Party. The strong socialist Christian labor union and the group of Catholic intellectuals detached themselves from the Catholic mainstream and joined the communists in the liberation front. They simply could no longer realize their program in the old establishment. While openly rejecting fascist quasi-anti-capitalism, they could not practice the old Christian socialism either, because even the term itself was banned within the Catholicism at the time. Another important factor was the Spanish Civil War. The Catholic mainstream unambiguously supported the Franco nationalists, while Christian socialists accused the Spanish Catholic establishment of being completely detached from the masses and part of the exploitative class of landowners. In other words, the Spanish case unambiguously revealed the notion of brotherhood between different social strata as a mere ideology of the oppressors. What's more, it became the ideology of fascists. And by taking a radical stance against fascism, Christian socialists, ipso facto, came to resent the Catholic ideal of corporatist society, as adopted by the fascists. Christian socialist literature from this time clearly reveals this, that this group started to believe that a much more radical activism than ever imagined by the founder of Slovene Christian Socialism, Janez Evangelist Krek, was needed. At the same time, time, Christian Socialists remained critical regarding communist dogmatism, especially on the issue of religion and Marxist-Leninist ontology. And the relationship between communists and Christian Socialists was very conflictive throughout the 1930s. In the People's Front movement in the mid-30s, cooperation between the two groups was based only on officials. Communists would, sell, uh, would call Christian socialists fascists from time to time. And the firm alliance appeared unlikely. The war, to which I will now finally turn, changed everything. Anti-fascist resistance in Yugoslavia during the war was unequally developed. It could be argued that in Yugoslavia anti-fascist resistance was strongest and most effective in cases where the old social establishment was weak. Resentment toward the old regime, which had easily surrendered the country to the Axis, was, wide, well, was widespread in Yugoslavia. Different occup occupational arrangements in different parts of Yugoslavia, however, meant very different conditions for mobilizing this resentment into resistance. It could be argued that the old elites across Yugoslavia in most cases chose the tactic, tactic of waiting for the outcome of the global conflict and trying to develop peaceful coexistence with the occupying forces or with the quizzling pseudo-government formation that emerged in Croatia and Serbia. So the main political and ideological tasks persuaded by the old elites in order to protect their power and class privileges initially involved pacifying the population. 
The basic project of Yugoslav anti-fascist resistance, on the other hand, was to unite the people of Yugoslavia, regardless of the fragmentation caused by the occupation. Conflict with both the old establishment and the occupying forces was thus unavoidable. In the summer of 1941, by which time most of the people's armed uprisings had begun in Yugoslavia, the primary tactic of the resistance movement was to establish alternative government institutions. These institutions were given different names, but most frequently they were called National Liberation Committees. National Liberation Committees were an idea of the communists, who took the initiative in the uprisings. They simply meant the organization in villages and small towns of people's meetings, which, at least in theory, were supposed to evolve into local councils that would support the partisan guerrilla units but also organize the lo local economy. Their political function was simply to detach the people from the influence of the old establishment. The revolutionary dimension was in the idea that the working people will for the first time in history get a sense of their power, even if the egalitarian distribution of land was not on the agenda at the time. These councils were apparently supposed to put pressure on more wealthy peasants to contribute more to their co uh, communities. Here I would like to bring up a brilliant lecture by the former ambassador of Venezuela in Slovenia, Nestor Lopez. Especially his comment regarding the district people's assemblies in Venezuela. Not only do people participate in managing certain uh, conditions of their daily lives, above all, people who no long ago were detached from bureaucratic municipal administrations, had learned that power of the power of the people tastes good. So, uh, in other words, we all know that the project of socialist development in Venezuela is still under the way, and that we have a parallel system. Uh, but giving the power to the people is a good way uh, to make them class conscious because uh, they get the feeling they can really change something, even though the goal, the establishment of the real socialist society is still uh, remote. National liberation committees had great initial success in Montenegro and Western Serbia, and the parties of the resistance effectively confronted the fascist military apparatus at the time. However, the old establishment was relatively strong in these territories, especially in Serbia. In Serbia, the military establishment under the leadership of Draža Mihailović formed its own pseudo-resistant movement, the Chetniks. But its tactic was to wait for the most appropriate moment. Initially, in the summer and autumn of 1941, there were negotiations between partisans and Chetniks, but they failed. On the level of national liberation committees, conflicts were caused by pro-Chetnik elements who resented any form of alternative institutions. Soon after, in the late autumn, Chetniks, with the support of German forces, attacked the partisans in Serbia. The partisan movement was eventually defeated in Serbia. It could be argued that this was because the old establishment could provide a pseudo-alternative for the population, a perfect simulacrum for resistance that would be tolerated by Germans, and that stood firmly for minimum sacrifices for the people. In 1942, Bosnia became the new locus of resistance and turned out to be most appropriate terrain for the partisan resistance. Bosnia was formerly a part of the independent state of Croatia, run by the fascist Ustasha movement, which initiated brutal ethnic cleansing among the Serbs. The population had little choice. The only way to escape the violence was to join the partisan movement, which stood for brotherhood and unity among nationalities. Here the appeal for the pacification obviously could not be effective. In the Croat territories, the old political establishment, and particularly the populist Croat Peasants Party, supported peaceful coexistence with the Ustasha movement. And it appears 
they were at least partly successful. Since the partisan movement there was a relatively weak initially, except in the regions with the Serbian population. Here I would argue that the simulacrum of national sovereignty granted to the Croats was decisive. This fact must be taken very seriously. The independent state of the Croatia was a fascist client state run by the Ustasha movement, which was reactionary as you can imagine. That's more than 100% true. However, compared with the arrangements in place in the Slovene territories at the time, it is possible to imagine that it might have been considered the lesser of two evils. Even some Croat communists, Hebrak and Zhujevic, were those, initially thought that the independent Croat state could be a good step forward. After 1939 and until 1941, in the context of Hitler-Stalin pact, there were negotiations between some Croat communist groups and Ustasha militants in Yugoslav prisons. Of course, when Yugoslavia collapsed and the Ustasha movement was handed power by the Germans, the communists were immediately arrested again. Furthermore, the Ustasha movement was a fascist movement and as such promoted a quasi-anti-capitalist program, praising the peasants over financial capital and the jewelry. Their program at least appeared to be continuation of the old peasants' party aspirations, and it appeared to be even more successful, since it had secured an independent state, something the populists of the old could have only dreamed about. When the first acts of violence were committed against the Serbian population in Lika, that is the mountainous hinterland of northern Albania, some of the peasants affected uh, regis, uh, registered their discontent with Zagreb. And when they did not get a reply, they asked the Italians for protection. Thousands escaped to Serbia, and the Quisling regime there took them under its protection, which somehow boosted the legitimacy of the Nedic regime. All I would like to say there is that the anti-fascist partisan resistance was by no means a neutral reaction and that anti-fascist activists strived really hard to organize people. And yes, in many cases, were not successful. That was why the partisan leadership strived to evolve the guerrilla, the, the guerrilla units to the level of the real army. The grassroots resistance of 1941 proved to be insufficient. So in 1942 and 1943, the grassroots resistance these units evolved this time to brigades, divisions, and finally armies, capable of penetrating into territories with weak local, with, uh, with weak local resistance. In 1943, there was a plan to launch an offensive into Serbia from the vast liberal territories of Bosnia, but major Axis offensives prevented this plan, which was eventually realized in the autumn of 1944 with the assistance of the Red Army. Now I will finally turn to the situation in Slovenia. <coughs> I will turn to the activities for the Liberation Front. Initially in the spring and summer of 1941, the Liberation Front was only building its political network throughout the country. At this point, its military actions lagged behind considerably. Compared with Serbia and Montenegro, the Liberation Front was organized by committees in towns and villages. At the top were the Executive Committee and the Supreme Plenum, where member groups had their delegates and editorial boards of journals, while on the lower levels, members were for the most part unaffiliated. The Communist Party took the initiative since it had more than 20 years of experiences in illegal underground work. In the spring of 1942, the partisan units managed to liberate a vast territory in the central and southern part of Slovenia. The process of formation of National Liberation Committee had been underway simultaneously. It could be argued that these committees were the most important achievement of the Liberation Front. Like in Serbia and Bosnia, these committees appeared reformist, 
in both their practice and their discourse. Private property over land remained untouched. Food was obtained from the peasants with money or special bonds issued by the movement. Liberation committees strive for the fair and equal distribution of agricultural products within peasant communities. The principle was simple. Those who produce more should also provide more for families in need. And documentation from the village liberation committees shows that a great deal of effort was invested in organizing the fair distribution of goods. It is important to emphasize that this distribution was not based on class principles. A resolution of a resistant commanding forum reads, I quote, Mutual aid rests on the consciousness that all individuals have to sacrifice a part of the comfort in order to serve their national community. Although the Marxist legitimation for equal distribution would ultimately derive from the theory of the relation of exploitation. The argumentation I just quoted was in fact closer to the Catholic principle of solidarity. This is very important in light of the fact that the liberation movement had literally colonized the old Catholic social program based on peasants' cooperatives, which had been in decline in the decades before the war. By doing so, it at least partly neutralized the resistance of the church establishment, which had been against the liberation movement from the outset, and assisted in organizing the white guard movement. In other words, the National Liberation Committees provided ideological hegemony for the liberation movement. I mentioned that the nature of these committees appeared to be reformists. It is, however, possible to identify certain elements of socialism. These elements become visible once we take a closer look at the class composition of the Slovene countryside at the time. The vast majority of peasants were small commodity producers, living on less than five hectares of land. The basic social relation inside this small household was, to use the concept developed by Russian agrarian economist Alexander Chayano, the self-exploitation of the family. The level of self-exploitation of these households was generated by the consumption requirements of family members who were forced to sell their products to capitalist traders in order to pay off their debts and order to sell their labor to medium and large farmers. The liberation committees monopolized the trade and put a lot of effort into, ex uh, into excluding capitalist traders. By organizing the distribution of food, not on the principle of labor, but on the principle of human, that was family needs, to the exclusion of traders, the liberation movement at least partly excluded the small peasants from the capitalist relations of production and reproduction. In other words, the small peasants became less and less economically dependent on the free market and on peasants with larger estates and more dependent on the liberation movement. To be more specific, the, re the relation between small peasants and middle-sized or large farmers is mediated not through market, but through the network of alternative institutions empowered by the partisan army. The victory of 1945 brought land reform almost immediately. Large estates were terminated. Peasants with medium and large estates had to pass some of their land onto small householders. Even though the peasants showed some reluctance toward the newly instated authorities led by the communists, it is possible to argue that, this, uh, that the adversaries of the deep social transformation that was underway in Yugoslavia had lost not only the war, but also ideological hegemony. To be sure, during the initial phase of the formation of resistance in Slovenia, tensions existed in the liberation front between the communists and the Christian socialists. These tensions emerged because the party acted voluntaristically. Literally all political co uh, commissars were communists, and the same is true of military leaders. The Czech-alike resistance secret police service was also under party's control. It was fighting mercilessly with Quislings shooting them in substantial numbers in the streets of Ljubljana. 
in broad daylight. Some partisan commanders were also hard-handed with the peasants in the countryside. Dizzy with success, some of these commanders brought the uh, commander thought, thought the time for Soviet-style collectivization had come. These acts boosted the White Guard movement. The Italian counter-offensive in the summer of 1942 caused major casualties for the partisans and led to a violence against the local peasants. In this crisis, the Christian, Christian socialists and members of the Sokol movement initially had the idea of forming independent parties in order to hold the communist influence in the resistance. These ideas were abandoned. The Christian socialists had frankly recognized the necessity that the Slovenian nation goes along the same path that the great Russian people already had. This is a long quote uh, from, from one uh, document which was signed by the Christian socialists in the world. Literally all liberal historians in Slovenia interpret this fact as disasters for the future development of Slovene society. Yet they ignore the fact that the Christian socialists and the Sokols had developed radical social positions before the war. Both these groups firmly believed that no social order was necessary. They were convinced that the new Yugoslavia should be completely different based on social justice and the equal state status of all Yugoslav nations. They didn't trust the Western type of parliamentary democracy, which had shown itself to be not only tolerant of fascism, but in the minds of some Christian socialists directly to, blame, to be blamed for this evil. Neglecting this fact implies ignorance of the experiences of the class and political struggles in which the Christian socialists were involved. And yes, uh, some uh, prominent Christian socialists, Edward Kotzbeck, for example, were also naive, believing the, believing the communists to be some sort of modern-day Christians, who only need to be civilized, or thought that religion is still an important factor in modern industrial societies. But I regard this naivety as a secondary factor. It was far more important that the Christian socialists had no other place to go to realize their more radical social positions. As I described earlier, the old uh, Catholic uh, political movement and its party was fragmented on the eve of the war. Within the Catholic mainstream, dominance was now in the hands of extreme right-wingers, who eventually became collaborators, with some uh, even openly promoted fascism and even Nazism. These people openly advocated for a society based on corporatism and harmony between the owners of land and means of production and producers. In their agenda, these issues were presented as the alternative to the liberation front, but also to Anglo-American capitalism. But they had one big problem. Their activism was completely supervised and dependent upon the fascist military and police apparatus. They did have some sort of cultural autonomy, but no chance, of, no chance of achieving any kind of political or military autonomy, not even symbolically. The Liberation Front, on the other hand, presented itself as a state within the state. It promoted the sovereignty of the Slovene nation. National Liberation Committees were the ultimate proof of the existence of such a state. They further validated the promise of the Liberation Movement that the new state will be completely different from the old kingdom of Yugoslavia, since the activism of the common people in these committees was, was essential. In other words, all promises made by the Quisling counter-revolution could be discredited by the mere fact of their collaboration. The attachment of the Catholic right-wingers to the fascist war machinery also meant that the struggle for power in Slovenia over the nature of the future social system, primarily had the form of national liberation and not open class war, as was the case with the Russian Revolution. I would like to finish now. Thanks for your attention. Uh, 
thank you, Leo, for the, this uh, <coughs> lecture. Now, uh, uh, I would like to open the floor for a, a round of uh, questions and comments and so forth. Uh, we already have one over there, uh, who uh, just wait for the microphone. Uh, yes, um, I found what you had to say very um, important. Um, both what you said now and earlier I read your um, short article in the, uh, in the, the uh, pamphlet for the, uh, for the meeting. Um, the, my, my feeling is that it's absolutely essential to do what you're trying to do, which is to build on your own national traditions um, and to build on that history as opposed to someone else's history. Um, and I think that that is essential, the essential project that you're engaged in in, in your examination of the, of the liberation front. Um, and I think, you know, because it's important because we're not talking about an abstract people. We're talking about particular people who must be reached and who must embrace the idea of building a new socialist society. Uh, the, one of the things that, uh, that struck me was when you quoted the Venezuelan ambassador um, to Slovenia uh, and his comment, because as he was speaking uh, about the local committees, um, that was exactly the parallel that I was thinking about. I, I spent six years in, in Venezuela during this period, and one of the characteristics of that was the development of the communal councils, councils of 100 to 200 people in the urban areas and 20 to 50 in the rural areas, and those councils were engaged in making local decisions. They had a council which they elected, but because the meetings were, the groupings were so small, most major decisions were made in a general assembly. Um, and as this local, these local decision-making groups were, were empowered to make decisions over local decisions such as, you know, fixing the roads in the areas, sanitation, etc. And then they became a lot, part of a larger block as different communal councils came together to form communes. Uh, and that's the process that's been happening in Venezuela there. And I can see very clearly the parallel in that respect between what was possible in the committees of the National Liberation Front and what was present in, uh, has been present in Venezuela. But, I was struck by a statement that you made on page 35 here, which is to say that the economic and political project of self-management was thus a policy that came from above and not from below. This resulted in the relative passivity of the workers in the project. And I think that you understate the importance of initiatives from above in this process. Overestimate or underestimate? I'm sorry? I overestimated. You you underestimate the importance of. I think initiatives from above are important. Um, that initiatives, you know, make the the top can make a decision which the bottom of those below would take many many years before they could consolidate to make such a decision. The issue is not who initiates the new project. The question is what when that new project is initiated is done to empower the people below. Um, you know, to what extent, and that's what happened in Venezuela. The, the communal councils, there were councils in many areas, uh, but those councils in those areas you know, were scattered, uh, undeveloped projects, and, and there was great unevenness. The decision to create the communal council as a national project was in fact a decision from the top, which says there should be communal councils in every neighborhood, in every area, etc., like that. And the key was to create a condition in which empowered people. That's the issue, not where the start began, where it started. The issue is what kind of process was created to empower people from below. Uh, so I, I think that, that you're, 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 you were basically saying there was original sin because the initiative came from the top. Uh, the, well, let me, that, that was a, a comment I wanted to make, but I also wanted to ask a question. I was very interested in what you had to say about the role of the, of the Christian socialists and the anti-clerical Catholics. Um, and I'm interested to know, you know, is there anything comparable now at this particular point? Because in Latin America, what is comparable is, you know, liberation theology. 
And, and Chavez himself, for example, was a product of liberation theology, you know, combining Catholicism and a building socialism. Uh, so is there anything that can, that can be built upon in terms of anti-clerical Catholicism or liberation theology in Slovenia now? That was the question. Um, this might be a short answer so now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I didn't mean to underestimate the role uh, of the center, but I will still say that uh, the Latin America historical process was a little bit different as it was in Yugoslavia, because, as we all know, because of the debt, debt crisis uh, in the Southern America, we have many spontaneous uprisings, continuing as far as I know from the 70s, 80s uh, and 90s. And of course, the political movement on the other side, and eventually the government, uh, made, uh, I mean, some forums which had been established by the people themselves as a mainstream uh, policy. But this was, I think, pretty much when everything goes more in parallel. While in Yugoslavia, we had uh, in 1945, until 1955, this uh, highly uh, centralized uh, plan uh, of economy, and I think that uh, some potentials uh, were uh, suppressed, even non-intentionally, I mean, after uh, the war. I, um, I think that this parallel is important because the, the Venezuelan is not yet socialist, uh, but the people, it's important how people get mobilized. I saw here in the, the parallels. But uh, what is the Catholicism from yesterday time and today's concern to Slovenia? No, 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 you are very far from Latin America here. <laughs> uh, our Catholicism of our time now, uh, you can't compare it. Uh, I would say in 1930s, I mean, uh, the Slovene People's Party was in a way a satellite of the Catholic Church, of the clergy. Now it is the opposite. Now the Catholic Church is a satellite itself to one distinguished political party. Uh, they, have, uh, they have absolutely nothing to tell the people, uh, uh, to offer them. Any strategy, they are uh, all bad moralists. Their spokesman adopted neoliberalism uh, shamelessly. Uh, and no, 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 uh, the old Catholicism uh, was defeated in the revolution. What we have here is a small uh, group, I mean, the establishment of the clergy, but it's uh, even very weak to mobilize the people. It's a different situation in Croatia or Serbia, pretty much different, where the establishment of clergy is stronger, I would say, or in Poland. But here, uh, no. Okay. Um. Any more questions? Uh, I would actually like to follow up on this comment, if I may. Um, I, I think what was mentioned on uh, page 35 was uh, more a reference to the uh, later on um, system of uh, self-management socialism, uh, post-war Yugoslavia, therefore, um, and not as much uh, for the uh, uh, National Liberation Committees during the war. Um, could you compare um, uh, the two in terms of worker uh, self-organization and uh, or passivity, uh, relative passivity, um, mm, well, well, uh, what went wrong, perhaps, if uh, there was, there was the potential was to a certain extent uh, uh, minimalized from above? Well. Uh I would say that uh, national liberation community uh, committees had their locuses on the countryside. Uh, they were actually organized. They were um, uh, actually uh, their locus. Uh, they took place in the self-sufficient, more than less self-sufficient uh, peasant communities. All of the needs could have been realized in these units. Of course, by the National Liberation Front activists, all of these peasant communities were uh, interconnected. But it's pretty much different as councils in the factories. One factory cannot be uh, self-sufficient. Uh, it's by, by the essence of the matter, uh, it 
cannot function the same way as did the, this uh, as did this national liberation uh, communities. Uh, it can it cannot be self uh, Workers in the factory cannot eat computers or uh, steal. They need. Uh, I mean, uh, I would say it's so much easier for the direct producers in the self-sufficient agricultural communities to control the whole system of production and reproduction when it is on the, uh, I would say, on the primitive level. I don't have the ultimate answer, what you ask, but uh, on these differences I just described, I would uh, start the explanation. Okay, um, any more questions or comments? Over there, please. Maybe one, just one question, uh, one comment and then, then a question. Uh, it seems to me that it's not so logical that the popular front generally is the, the, the main target, so to say, of the bourgeoisie. The main target of the, of the bourgeoisie, well, it's a, it's a big trauma. The, uh, the, uh, constant, not the constant, but the politics of, of uh, the popular front. Because it's actually, uh, it's... Uh, it was, it has been one of the most uh, successful political strategies in the history and maybe not just of the, of the 20th century, maybe not just of the revolutionary movement, maybe in general, when you compare the, uh, when you compare the fringe position of the communist movement, for instance, relative fringe position of the communist movement in the late 20s, with, uh, with its uh, position after the World War II, when the communist movement basically becomes the, uh, the main, uh, 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 the main, uh, uh, how to say, alternative, alternative to the system. So uh, it would seem that uh, the uh, insistence of the, for instance, Slovenian uh, liberal uh, historians, their the point of, uh, the, the insistence on attacking uh, the, the liberation front and uh, the popular front uh, politics in Slovenia, comes from this, from this uh, trauma, and uh, so. Basically, the bourgeoisie is right when they attack, uh, when they, uh, how to say, they are right when they want to uh, fight against the, when they have to, have to uh, disqualify the politics of the popular front. So from their first position, it's a, it's a correct position. But the uh, point where they are wrong is uh, when they, um, uh, when they see this, uh, uh, communist hegemony in the popular fronts as uh, some kind of communist hijacking of the, of the system. Well, it, is this basically wrong because uh, uh, the popular front strategy did not uh, hijack the movement, it was the movement, it was the only alternative in the, most of the countries. In the situations when uh, the system fell apart, like the occupation of Yugoslavia, basically the old bourgeois system has fallen apart, and, uh, for instance, the Croatian uh, uh, main bourgeois party did not participate in uh, world, uh, world uh, in wartime politics in any way because it, it was quite openly uh, said that uh, it's, it's not sure which side will win. That, that means that it, it, it has never, because of the peripheral position, it has never uh, been, a, uh, it had never had a, its own specific uh, position from which it could then develop its its own politics. So, in a way, uh, the popular, what my point is that the Popular Front strategy uh, uh, gave the opportunity to the communist movement to act as the, uh, the main political force in a situation where the, the where the old uh, comprador periphery capitalism has fallen apart and was changed with something else. So, this seems to me like the most important uh, lesson left also today, because we also live in a, uh, a countries of the former Yugoslavia in a, a dependent uh, uh, peripheral countries where, where the bourgeoisie is um, very uh, unindependent and very, uh, uh, how to say, exposed to, to the earthquakes in the system itself. And uh, the question I wanted to ask you, uh, it's a completely different thing, is uh, when you uh, explain the specific position of uh, Catholic Socialism and how uh, the uh, Liberation Front, uh, in a, in a, to a large part, took over the, the, uh, 
the, the program of, of uh, uh, this uh, Christian socialism. Uh, do you think, uh, maybe you could explain, uh, how this could have uh, uh, influenced the future development of the uh, deepest of uh, economics in Yugoslavia, especially in reference to, to the fact that uh, this was actually one of the points that uh, in, in the correspondence between the Soviet Party in 48 and the Yugoslav Communist Party, this was, this was a point of critique of the Soviet Party to the Yugoslav Party, that it had taken its front, uh, front program as a, instead of the socialist program. Uh, I will answer, try to answer the question. I would say that uh, since the, it might be argued that the Yugoslav anti-fascist resistance in general was the last peasants war in Europe. <coughs> so, uh, the movement was really peasant uh, in nature. You didn't have the separate uprising, two separate uprisings, one in towns and uh, one <coughs> and one on the periphery. So, uh, for that reason, I think the outcome, the development after the war, was uh, different. Uh, took the different shape as it did uh, in the Soviet uh, Union. They didn't uh, really try to uh, start with the collectivization. They tried a little bit in the 1948, but uh, not uh, really. I think that the Yugoslav communists who were uh, in the leadership uh, of the movement <coughs> wanted to avoid the Soviet type of collectivization at all costs because they knew it from the Soviet example, what it means. And they wanted uh, to take uh, the advantage that the Soviet Union was already an uh, industrial superpower to get some assistance from the Soviet Union. They got it eventually, but when they broke up with the Soviet Union, the West supported Yugoslavia. So that is why the socialist uh, primitive accumulation uh, did uh, took place uh, in Yugoslavia. But uh, what is the legacy of Christian socialism concerned? That is why, uh, I mean, the resistance won the hegemony because it was close to the old ideologies. And at that time, uh, the Communist Party of Slovenia, I know the Slovenian example for the most, uh, was taking many uh, hundreds and thousands of new members. And at that time, uh, you could be a party member even if you were religious. It was unlike in the 1970s. You were declarative, a Catholic or Muslim or anything of these identities. You could not be, theoretically, be a member of the League of the Communists of Yugoslavia, Slovenia, Croatia. But during the war, you could be. So... That's. Okay, over there. Yes, I have or three comments to make. I mean, there has been a second country with a strong, even military resistance movement in Eastern Europe and Czechoslovakia. There's some similarities actually with uh, Yugoslavia. The rather over the character of the political and Catholic system and with the inclusion of parts of the local bourgeoisie. <coughs> Bourgeoisie in the Slovak National Advisor in 1940. It's a formation, something like a coalition between the Communist Party and dissidents from the bourgeois democratic forces. But in Slovakia, <coughs> the Slovak left and, and the Slovak democratic, bourgeois democratic, Forces still had links to the Czech, to the Czech part of the country, the reunification, and there was a much more industrial environment. And so far, the last of the questions in 1944 and 1945 played a much larger role. And the question 
of how to reorganize the economy. If part, let's say, of the more left-wing reformists, part of the Centrist parties were in favor of partial nationalization, banks, major industries, and of forms of planning, whatever that um, implied. And here the question of democ democ democratic decision making at the national level, I mean, emerges. And that is much more difficult than to do it at the local level or at the factory level. I would say that this was one of the points never resolved in the state of this country. Even in the more reformist moments like 1968 in Czechoslovakia, um, that question was not really, not really taken up. I think that was one of the main deficits of the state socialist, of the state socialist era. I would say that it's even today for a for left to democratize Economic policy making is one of the main challenges. And I would say for Slovenia today, that uh, would be one of the major challenges. So, in a very different context from the 1930s or 1940s, for the external influences, for example, are, are different from that they used from the time in the, in the past. Secondly, the social structure today is very very different from what it was in the 1930s or 1940s. And so far, the social lines for movement, let's say, of transformative change would be very different from that time. And here the question is, what, what is the heritage to see that it still can be used for today's yeah, consideration? Uh, what is the heritage? Of the heritage of the national liberation struggle in Slovenia, can be updated, actualized in the present, present situation. That would be, one, would be one question. Second question would be, in your introduction, you mentioned the question, you said that the class differences were a bit papered over during the struggle itself. I would say for questions of it being a situation. <coughs> but if today, I mean, I think there's a necessity to build a broad alliance in order to change things on the one hand, and then on the other hand, to have organizations which propose a clear political agenda. But I mean, that is a certain tension that has to be resolved. Otherwise, if you only go for certain class, very narrow class issues, it would be very difficult to, to build a, a line that is broad enough in order to get things changed. Okay, uh, what is the legacy heritage? Uh, I say, I believe there is little uh, we can uh, take from the past to help us, I mean, organizing uh, the people today to resist. Uh, and uh, I explained at the beginning why that is so. I mean, Slovenian society today, in structure, as you said, is completely different than it was in the 30s and 40s. The time it was completely peasant society. More than 60% of people uh, lived uh, on the house on the peasant uh, households. Today, less than 2% of the active, we have two, less than 2% of active uh, of uh, peasant population. However, what uh, still life lives on, after the revolution, the country was industrialized. A well, a socialist type of a welfare state was introduced. Still today, <coughs> our country, Slovenia, is an exception with many other, the most other <coughs> form of socialist countries. There is a still uh, large assets are uh, state an appropriation of state. And I believe, uh, we believe uh, this could be a good start to socialize them, to give this property back to the people that they can control it. This kind of uh, public sector uh, and uh, a 
economy. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be like that if there was not a socialist revolution during uh, the war. I think that is the, le le the, the legacy and the effects. But uh, we cannot, I hardly believe we can copy, I mean, uh, the principles of organizations. It's too easy to say today, okay, we'll copy uh, people's front strategy, but that is so abstract that we say, okay. We always, I mean, a single movement for itself can never achieve great transformations in the society. Always needs partners, it needs to work together with others, but uh, not in the way as it was in the 1930s, especially not in the 1940s. Okay, um, now uh, our time is uh, running shortly, I guess, so perhaps one more brief question or comment, or if... Uh, okay. Yeah, um, I just have a very simple question. It doesn't mean it's easy to answer. Um, but you know, you, you talk a lot about various kinds of or, or organizations, uh, and they were all authoritarian. You know, the Catholics and, and, and the Germans. Uh, what do you think is the appeal of authoritarian organizations uh, that gives them a mass basis? In other words, you know, what went wrong, you have to say, okay, the organizations did this and that, but on the other hand, there's something about such organizations that, that wins them a mass basis. So what kind of issue there do you think needs to be addressed? Uh, I think uh, that uh, Catholicism was able to address the masses because it provided an uh, alternative model to survival. Because these territories could not compete with the more developed uh, centers or the territories uh, of Europe. So uh, the political Catholicism in Slovenia and also in Croatia territories developed uh, this program of cooperatives, of saving banks and mutual help. That was something really con concrete. It was not uh, only obey as told by a priest in the church. It was a real concrete activities. That is why we were, were successful. The Catholicism, the political parties could not exist in those days without being a movement. A movement to capable the, about to mobilize the people and solve their concrete daily problems. It's not like that today. We have political parties who are more than less completely detached from the masses. They are like companies. They are communicating with the people via PR. That is completely different. That is how the Catholicism, and even fascism, in the 1930s or 1920s in Italy, it had mobilizing appeal because it could solve, it could answer for some problems. That is why it was successful. We should read these marvelous writings by Palmiro Palmir Togliatti, his lectures on fascism, when he describes in details how the fascism is organized in Italy, what he has done for the workers, what was not before, for example. That is... Okay. Well, uh, with that, I uh, would like to conclude uh, this lecture. Uh, thank you, Leo, for a very interesting uh, lecture and also despite your sickness. So, a round of applause, if you will. Before you all go, I would like to uh, invite you to uh, two other events today. Uh, first, at uh, 13 o'clock, uh, we are going to go a bit more into theory proper with a panel discussion on primitive accumulation as a concept with uh, Henry Bernstein, uh, Christo Harman and uh, Sasha Perlan. And uh, later on in the afternoon at 18 o'clock, a keynote lecture by Andrew Kleiman. Thank you.